Part of being a living being is maybe getting sick, and reptiles are not immune. So today let's go over the top five most prevalent, most common illnesses, and how you can treat your reptile at home. My name's Adam, this is Diamond, you're watching Wiccan's Wicked Reptiles, stick around. So to be perfectly clear, I'm not against vets, and I think that certain things, a lot of things, you need to go see a vet for. So this is not an excuse not to go to a vet. I'm not saying that do these things uh, and don't ever go to a vet. If you do these things, you're okay. Vets know more than I do. So take everything here with a grain of salt, but I'll explain as we go. I think the number five most common thing is stuck shed. Now this normally isn't a big deal and probably the easiest one to rectify. Now this usually happens on snakes. So let's say a ball python, for example. Now, actually, first of all, it can happen to lizards too. Here's a great example. This is a blue tongue skink. This isn't really stuck shed. Well, it, it was, but we did the first step, which is taking a bath, giving this animal a bath and the, sh the shed came right off, basically immediately. And things like, say, ball pythons or reticulated pythons, you'll see on Brian Barchuk's channel all the time, he has stuck shed issues with his reticulated python. Now, this isn't really an issue with humidity, which is, can be an issue if you your humidity isn't proper. Sometimes you'll have stuck shed on your animals. It's just that big snakes often don't shed in one piece. So, just like Brian shows you on his videos, you take an animal, you put it into a bath, and then that gives it a little bit more humidity, it gives it a little bit more I guess, moisture between that skin and the shed skin and the new skin to loosen it up and you can help the animal. Never rip it off, but you can kind of gently massage it off if you want using your hand, a cloth, whatever. The first step to avoiding stuck shed is to make sure that you have the proper parameters. Things like the proper humidity level, for example. If you have the proper humidity, most of the time you're not gonna have stuck shed. It's still possible, but a lot of the times, things that need more humid environments, like say Indonesian blue tongues or uh, ball pythons, to keep with this example, they're going to need higher humidity. And the reason that you're having stuck shed issues is because you don't have that. Leopard geckos is another great example. If you don't give a human hide to a leopard gecko, it can have stuck shed issues, and this can be more difficult because baby leopard geckos and leopard geckos in general are kind of dainty, they're more fragile, so it's more difficult to help them out. Eye caps are another thing. Stuck eye caps are part of stuck shed because snakes' eyes don't blink, so when they shed their skin on their body, they shed their eye skin too. Sometimes the eye, the eye piece of skin, which is called the eye cap, will just get stuck, and then you have to peel that off with tweezers. If you don't know what you're doing, go to a vet. So, proper humidity, human hides during shedding, and overall, I mean, it's not the most difficult thing in the most part. If you are stuck with the stuck shed, go to a vet, don't try to force it. Number four, mites. Now, snake mites are going to happen generally if you have a larger collection. Sometimes it doesn't matter how hard you try, it doesn't even matter how hard you try, it's still gonna happen. Now of course there's videos that I've done before, like up here, about quarantine, where you quarantine animals to make sure that you're not gonna have issues with mites, because mites are uh, basically a parasite that hides underneath the skin, uh, in the heat pits, around the mouth of snakes, and they suck the blood basically, and then they go ahead and they lay eggs in the substrate, the eggs hatch, and then you have an infestation basically. So quarantine your animal first of all, so that your new snake isn't, if it's infected, isn't with the other snakes and infecting it. Because if you have one mite, you're gonna have lots of mites. They will spread through enclosures and spread through collections like wildfire, and people are gonna tell you, oh, it's easy. It's not. If you have a lot of snakes, it is a pain. You're gonna, it's gonna be one of the most stressful things you have to deal with to try to prevent it. If you have this issue, there's a few things. Predatory mites. This is a defense before you actually get mites. There are predatory mites. I'll put the name right here. I can't pronounce it or even remember off the top of my head. I actually don't know how to pronounce it at all. And these are going to eat the bad mites, the snake mites. So you're not gonna have an issue. They're also gonna eat the eggs. Another thing you can do is prevent a mite. So when you get a new snake, I always treat the enclosure, the quarantine enclosure anyway, but if you have snakes in the substrate and you don't want to dump all the substrate, prevent a mite, their label is on the can, please, for the love of God, follow the instructions. Here, I'll show you. Instructions are right on the back of this thing. Follow them. I'm not even going to repeat them. I want you to read them. 
not hear them once and forget and only do half of it. This can kill your reptiles if you don't do it properly and be careful around snakes such as hognose snakes because the ingredient in Preventamite, uh, Nyx, uh, Frontline, which are things we're gonna get to in two seconds, will kill your hognose snake. So do your research, know what species you're treating. If you can't get access to Preventamite, you can use things like Nyx, which is a head lice uh, shampoo. That works, I've done that before. You mix it up in diluted water, follow the instructions. Uh, also Frontline spray. Again, do more research. I'm not telling you how to do it. I'm just telling you these are the solutions. And there's a video right here about mites, and there's a part two as well you can find in the description of that video. The way you're gonna know if your snake has mites, if there's little black things crawling on them, if the animal is bathing more than normal, like if you find a Dormel's bow in its water, chances are it has mites. Also, the snake is going to shed more often, so if you see a snake shedding every couple weeks, I mean, it might be, it's trying to get rid of the mites is what it is. Number three, clogged pores, femoral pores. Now, here's a picture of a bearded dragon's pores that are clogged. And here's a picture of a bearded dragon's pores that are not clogged. You see the difference. Now, the reason that things like bearded dragons, iguanas, jeweled lacertas, have femoral pores, the males, is so that when they're scurrying along on branches and logs and rocks, they're kind of producing uh, these oils. And the oils have a scent, and they're marking their territory. That's what it's for. Now, these in the wild are going to have lots of opportunities for rough surfaces to kind of shed these femoral pores, the skin around the pores, and the oils inside of them that are secreted generally will not get clogged up, but if they do, they can scrape them off on these rough surfaces, and they have no issues. In captivity, a lot of the times, especially if you're using things like reptile carpet or tile or things like that, a whole video right here about why the care guide from PetSmart you shouldn't follow. This is gonna be an issue because they're not gonna have anything rough to scrape these pores on. Now, some people are gonna tell you that sand and loose substrates are gonna be an issue and gonna clog up the pores. No, as long as you're giving them rocks and branches and things like that that are rough for them to scrape off, it's going to be like in nature. Because in nature, guess what? They don't live on paper towels. It's not a thing. I've talked to people in the outback. It turns out there are no bounty sheets all over the ground. It's hard clay mixed with sand and rocks. So those things would clog up pores too if they didn't have the opportunity to scrape them off. Now, if you have issues with pores that are clogged in your bearded dragon, let's use as an example. You're gonna fill up a Tupperware container full of water. Well, not full, but about this much so that the bearded dragon's head easily sticks out and it's going to be able to cover those pores which are on the bottom of its back legs. Then you're gonna make sure this water is the right temperature. I always go, 90-ish degrees, right? Probably like 88 degrees, something like that. This is 89 degrees. Let the dragon soak five, 10, 15 minutes. Don't let the humidity, don't put a lid on it, which I don't recommend. You can do this with the shedding, by the way. I always put a lid on the uh, enclosure. The water's low enough. This seems like common sense, but I'm just making sure you know. So the, here's a representation in video form, how I do this, and then you take the dragon, you lift up its tail and you use either a cloth or you use say a toothbrush with soft bristles, not the hard bristles, the soft bristles. And you're gonna kinda gently try to remove them. You can also use things like tweezers, but be very careful. And again, when in doubt, if you don't feel comfortable, don't hurt your animal, go to a vet. And if it wasn't obvious, make sure that you have things like rocks and rough branches and things like that in the enclosure so that you can have them rub their butt back legs, femoral pores, and they don't have these issues in the first place. Now, if they're infected, this is what they look like when they're infected. Go to a vet. I don't have advice for you to treat yourself. Just go to a vet and they will handle it for you. Number two, mostly in snakes, but can happen to lizards too, respiratory infections. Now, I've had these issues before and I go to a vet. That's just basically it. There are ways, first of all, this is how you tell. If, say, a ball python, if the ball python is wheezing, gasping, if the animal is yawning excessively, if there's mucus coming out of its mouth, things like that, it's probably got a res respiratory infection. With bigger snakes like berms, sometimes you'll see them stargazing, so they're kind of looking up to the ceiling all day. This can be a sign that respiratory infections are about to start. Now, what I recommend, and the thing that is most likely going to give your animal respiratory infections are either other animals with respiratory infections, right? Because it could be a bacteria that is contagious, which is another reason you quarantine animals, but also uh, just proper humidity isn't being administered. So if you have an animal like a Burmese python and it has 40% humidity, or even a ball python, you're probably going to get a respiratory infection because it isn't humid enough. Same thing with a monkey tail skink or whatever. Just like that, 
If you have an animal that is, say, a desert dwelling species, a more arid species, and it's too wet, these animals can get respiratory infections from that too. And ball pythons, if they're kept at 100%, that's going to give them a respiratory infection too sometimes. So that's why humidity is so important. If the humidity is right, if the temperature is right, then you're probably not going to have issues. Now, if you have a respiratory infection or you think one is starting, bump up the temperature a little bit. Higher temperature is probably going to help. Not too much. Use common sense. If your ball python needs you know, to be around 85 degrees, don't bump it up to 105. Give them five extra degrees and give them the cool side so that they can escape from it if they don't like it. But in my experience, if I see what I think is going to be a respiratory infection and I give it a couple days, obviously waiting for a vet appointment at a higher temperature, oftentimes the respiratory infection never happens in the first place. Now, if you've already seen nasal bubbles and bubbles around its mouth and wheezing, generally it's too late and you're gonna have to do drugs at the vet. Don't administer drugs yourself. You're gonna have to get medicine from the vet. So go to a vet, period. I know it's expensive and it's a pain in the arse. Just do it. Otherwise, you're gonna have a sick and maybe dead snake, and that is bad. Respiratory infections are basically drowning in their own lungs. It's really uncomfortable, it's really cruel. You have to go see a vet. And the number one illness that I see in reptiles, metabolic bone disease. Unfortunately, there's no way to reverse this. Metabolic bone disease is basically when the bones are not synthesizing calcium properly, and this is why we give bearded dragons calcium supplementation and UVB because things like bearded dragons need UVB to synthesize calcium properly. Otherwise, their bones don't process calcium properly and their bones start to uh, change shape and don't work properly. And that's why Bob Majul Lacerda would walk around like this. He had severe metabolic bone disease when I got him. I finally got him the proper care. He lived a healthy life for the rest of his life. RIP Bob, he died six or seven months ago, uh, but he never, regain control of those limbs. They always look like T-Rex limbs, but it didn't get any worse. Floyd, another example, my box turtle, he's got this weird shell. It should be concave or convex rather. Cave is convex is the math is hard. This isn't even math. These is just words. Adam, get it together. But it's not. It's like this weird shape. Also say things like um, tortoises. Tortoises will sometimes have pyramiding on their shell where they should have a more round shell. This can be because of metabolic bone disease too. Now, it depends on the species. Sometimes it's not just lack of UVB or lack of calcium or lack of vitamins. It could be things like in box turtles, if you don't give them the proper diet, redfoots, for example, too, then they can have the pyramiding and metabolic bone disease. But at the end of the day, if your animal has metabolic bone disease and you don't do anything about it, they're going to die a sick, horrific death. You have to administer the proper UVB and the proper supplementation. And you're not gonna reverse, but at least you're not gonna make it get any worse. Example, I have scoliosis. That means that my spine is curved. I'm not gonna be able to re rejuvenate a linear spine, straight spine that's like not in the cards for me, right? I was born this way, it got worse over time, but through exercise, I can make sure that my spine doesn't curve anymore, right? This is the same thing with metabolic bone disease. It's not going to get better, or at least it's not gonna get so much better that it's not gonna be like they don't have it at all, but you can stop it and give them a more healthy, more comfortable life than if you didn't do anything at all. Of course, you can always go to a vet too. I mean, all of these things, if you're not comfortable, go to a vet. There's no shame in going to vets. I'm just trying to give you options of what to do at home so that you're not helpless while you're waiting for an appointment. So there you go. Those are the top five illnesses I see the most in reptiles and the ways that you can treat or at least partially treat while you wait for a vet appointment. Let me know in the comments section below. What do you think? What are the ones that you see most often? How do you treat them? Let me know. And of course, I want to say thanks for hitting the like and subscribe button. It helps this channel so much. You don't even understand so much. It helps. And a special thanks to the Patreon supporters. You guys get merch. You guys get discounts on merch, videos early, behind the scenes, all this stuff. And oh yeah, that thing in the corner, the arboreal setup that you can't tell what's in it. Patreon already knows, but the video is coming next week or the week after. Anyway, for as little as a dollar a month, you get all that and more. That's it. Hope you enjoy. See you next time.